I want to welcome everyone who's here. For those who don't know me, my name is Amy Krupel and I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. Um, our center is a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence funded by the European Union, as well as a Title VI National Resource Center for Europe. We are housed in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, but we are a multidisciplinary area and language studies program serving the entire campus community. A few housekeeping notes, this discussion and presentation will be recorded and it will be available on the CES website. We will have time for questions and answers following the presentation. And we ask that all participants who have a question, please submit those through the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen rather than the chat function. If you would prefer to speak your question, you can either indicate this by raising your hand or making a note in the Q&A area that you would like to ask your question orally. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, we are here today to discuss Return to the Motherland, a Soviet woman's journey from Nazi Germany to Stalin's Gulag. This talk is part of the center's lunchtime symposium series. We host three to four lunchtime symposiums a semester for faculty and advanced graduate students to present their research on a European topic from any discipline. If you have a topic that you would like to present, please contact Carla Rufer. That's rufferc at ufl.edu, but you can also just go to the website, ces.ufl.edu, uh, and you'll find us. We will also post the email in the chat window. In addition to lunchtime symposiums, the center offers a variety of funding opportunities for faculty and students, including summer research travel grants, a working group conference grant, course development and course enhancement grants, and more. All of those are available, uh, more information is available on the CES website, again, ces.ufl.edu, and just go to the funding page. There are some upcoming deadlines, so we would encourage you to go and look soon. Our speaker today is Dr. Seth Bernstein, an assistant professor of history at UF. He is a historian of the Soviet Union, Russia, and post-Soviet states, and works with digital humanities. He was previously an assistant professor of history at Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and he has published Raised Under Stalin, Young Communist and the Defense of Socialism in 2017 with Cornell University Press. Dr. Bernstein is currently finishing a book for Cornell to be published next academic year called Return to the Motherland, Displaced Soviets in World War II and the Cold War. And it is part of that research that he's discussing today. And we are very lucky to have with us as moderator today, Dr. Cheryl Krohn, a former director of the Center for European Studies and an associate professor of history at UF who is in the final stages of working on her book, The Recovery, 1945 to 1953, Lessons from the Rubble of Europe. And she has now committed to offering us some uh, presentation of that research when it's complete. So mark your calendars apparently for a year from now. At the end of the event, everyone will be taken to a brief survey. We ask that you pause to complete that survey, survey so that we can get input from you and continue to improve our uh, available presentations. And with that, I will be closing my video and mic and become an observer and hand the microphone over to Dr. Bernstein, our presenter today. Well, thank you, Amy, for that nice presentation of um, me. And thank you, Cheryl, for, for being here. And all of you, um, I'm sorry, you know, you're not in the room with us, so to say, you know, in a real room would be nice, but even in a, in a Zoom room, but I can see you on here and I'm really glad to see some familiar names. Um, this work comes from my book project called Return to the Motherland, and I think they're working on the subtitle, but you can always find it with Return to the Motherland. I think that's set in stone. Uh, it's about the deportation of millions of Soviet or East European peoples to the Third Reich, and then their journey back to the Soviet Union after World War II. These are people who were forced laborers during the war mostly, or POWs, and then people who were victimized after the war by Stalin's regime, treated as not victims, but as traitors, traitors to the motherland. Today, I'm looking at one of them as a case study that can, that can carry this whole book project, or at least um, important aspects of it. This is the story of Nadezhda Severilova, the nominal Soviet woman, um, who ended up in Nazi Germany as a for forced laborer when she was 14 years old, or excuse me, 15 years old. Um, the search for love brought her to northern, uh, into Italy, taking on Polish identities, Italian identities. Uh, and then finally, she ended up back in the Soviet Union in 1947. After several years there, she would be sentenced to a gulag, 
a 25 year gulag sentence as a supposed spy. Um, this case is unique in a lot of ways. Um, I have not come across many cases, in fact, any cases of someone who, who pretended to be Italian, of Soviet citizens who were Ukrainians usually, or Russians, or maybe Baltic citizens, people from the Baltic republics. That said, the uniqueness of her case is what allows us to use it as a window onto the broader story of repatriation for slaver. Her um, unusual story brought her to the attention of the secret police who recorded her testimony, who interrogated her over many nighttime sessions. And um, in addition to recording some very spurious information about her, her, her journey, they also recorded lots of things that are um, clearly true or clearly reflect um, important aspects of the forced labor experience and the experience of return. In important ways, her story is similar to millions of East Europeans who are taken to the German, uh, from the German occupied East to the Third Reich and the ways that Stalin's regime tried to deal with the chaos that emerged from that story, tried to take people like Severilova who could become Polish and Italian and to make them Soviet again, um, at first in the Soviet Union and then in Kazakhstan and the Gulag. Let me start by just showing, just giving you the geography of her story from Kiev to Germany, to after the war, to Southern Germany, to Italy, to St. Valentin in Austria, then to Kiev again, and then to Kazakhstan. Okay, just to give you a sense of that. And I'll come back to this map um, at various times during the presentation. Um, now, Severilova's journey to Germany was something of a historical accident. Hitler did not intend to use people like Severilova as forced laborers. Germany, uh, as it invaded parts uh, of Europe, as it took over various countries, it took in forced laborers from the, all corners of Europe. But Hitler, because of his racial prejudices and his, the sense that Eastern Europeans were the lowest on the totem pole of races in Europe, did not want to use people like Ukrainians. There was a sense um, among the German leadership, not only Hitler, that Germany would knock the Soviet Union out of the war very quickly. And once that happened, there would be no need to use these people as forced laborers. When the Soviet Union didn't fold in the first weeks of the war, and in the first months, German leaders realized that they were facing a war that would last months, maybe years, and that they would need to free up more German men to serve in the army. That meant they needed to take um, people from Eastern Europe and POWs to work in German factories to be replacement workers. Um, now, at first, German officials and the local officials in places like Ukraine and Belarus, these occupied territories, hoped to recruit people as volunteers. So they used posters like I'm showing here, it says Germany calls you, go with enthusiasm, to work in Germany, um, in Ukrainian. They were recruiting people who were 15 and older, but in some cases they went even younger, people who were 14, 13. And of course, families would go with younger children sometimes. It quickly became clear that not that many people wanted to go, uh, wouldn't go voluntarily to Germany. And the Germans started to deport people by quota. This is how Nadezhda Severilova uh, went to Germany. She was given some kind of um, deportation order. She was forced to go to a, a gathering point and she was put on a train to Germany. Now, how many people went with her? Um, we only have a vague sense of how many. The combined number of people who were displaced among uh, civilians and prisoners of war who went to the Third Reich was something like 7 million. We just don't know though, because the number of POWs who died um, in Germany is, is not clear from, at least from Soviet statistics. So the general sense that about is about 5 million civilians went to Germany, people like Severilova, um, or were displaced by German forces and sent to work in various parts uh, that, uh, of Europe that were occupied by the Third Reich. 
and that um, at least 2 million POWs went to work in Germany. But that number is, of course, higher because so many of them died. Uh, the numbers of the mortality rate among POWs was horrific. Now, what awaited these people was almost slavery, um, especially with POWs. Work was um, only marginally better than people in Nazi death camps. And of course, the death rate among these people was about 25%. The overall death rate among Soviet prisoners of war was, uh, you know, some people estimated between 43 and 60%. Once they escaped Eastern Europe, where the death camps were, or where um, POW camps were uh, much more, uh, much more difficult, where the conditions were often fatal, the mortality rate was lower. But even in the Third Reich, um, the inability to leave camps, to be behind barbed wire all the time, to have starvation rations, meant that the mortality rate among Soviet POWs was something like 25%. Civilians had a slightly better fate. This is people like Nadezhda Sivarilova. A large portion of these civilians were taken to factories to work in Germany. Um, where they were promised good working conditions, where they were promised good wages, food, even um, that their families would be paid as replacement for their labor. The truth was, was, not, uh, was not like that advertisement. Um, their conditions were quite bad. They faced um, almost starvation rations. They were kept prisoner essentially in labor camps um, until pretty late in the war at which time most forced laborers were allowed to go into cities and had some access to do extra work that helped them survive. Even among this population of civilian um, Eastern workers, right, Osterbeiter in German, the death rate was about 6%. Um, they were overrepresented in deaths from air raids that the allies uh, conducted in Germany because they were closer to factories. And of course, um, they had worse medical care and worse, um, worse food and, and living conditions. Now, there are people like Severilova as well. And here's a picture of someone, um, not Severilova, but a, another forced laborer who was sent to a farm um, like Severilova was. We don't have pictures of Severilova in her, in her days as a forced laborer, she was sent in 1942, in the spring, to work on a farm near Seitzwedel uh, in the north, in north central Germany. She was working for a family, um, and there were other Eastern workers around her. Uh, we don't know that uh, much about her specific circumstances, but oral histories uh, from people like Halina K. K this woman who's in this picture, suggests that conditions were a little bit better than in the factories. They had to work very hard uh, at these farms. Farm labor didn't take a day off, right? The cows still need milking on, on Sundays and that's um, what these people did. Uh, and yet the conditions tended to be better because there was more food at farms. The families usually treated them better than um, factory overseers. And in some cases, they were almost adopted by these families, like um, Carolina Kay was by the Google Biklers, who um, treated her almost as a daughter, she said in a post Soviet interview. Um, and then there are other cases, um, arguably, that the top level of these Eastern workers, in terms of their conditions, was people who were taken into households to be maids and domestic servants. Conditions there could be bad as well, but typically they were treated also as part of the family. They lived in nice households, often Nazi elite households. Um, now, Severilova worked alongside a woman named uh, Anna Sh Antonina Shubovich, who was at another farm, but in the area. And so she also had this support network, um, someone who she could talk to. Now, um, she wasn't the only foreign worker in the area. Nazi Germany recruited people from all the corners of Europe. It was very common for Polish workers to interact with these Soviet um, Soviet-born Eastern workers, people from Ukraine or Belarus. Um, and you would see them gathering in groups on Sundays, the only days they, they had off to have dances and um, you know, singing contests and that sort of thing. 
in the case of Severilova and her friend Antonina Shubovich, the neighbors that they had were Italian POWs. In, um, during the war, Italy changed sides to the Italian government throughout Mussolini and went over to the Allies, uh, which made Germany uh, occupy Northern Italy and set up a puppet government and to take loyalist Italian soldiers, Italian sol soldiers who are loyal to the, um, to the government that supported the Western allies prisoner. There are Italian POWs for this reason uh, near where Severilova was uh, and where Shubovich was. They befriended these Italian POWs and you know, romance in ensued. Now, how often this happened is, is unclear. It's, we know from oral histories and from some limited diary materials and from Soviet, um, Soviet reports that there were thousands, tens of thousands, maybe in the low hundreds of thousands of marriages that um, emerged from these relationships. There were Soviet people who married, but uh, married non-Soviet people, but then wanted to hide that because they wanted to stay in Europe and they took their partner's name and then didn't register themselves. So it's, it's kind of an open question how many there were. My sense though, is that these relationships were fairly common for a number of reasons. One is that these were young people who came to Eastern Europe or come, came from Eastern Europe to Germany. They um, were at the time of, the, of their lives and they would be dating in the Soviet Union too. They are looking for love, right? There are people who um, were experiencing not only forced labor, but a lot of things for the first time. Um, now foreign workers, other foreign workers, non-Soviet foreign workers were often attractive partners because they tended to have more privileges than Eastern workers. Eastern workers were kept in uh, pretty dire conditions, as I mentioned, whereas other foreign workers, especially people who are West, Western workers, uh, Westarbeiter, so people from France or from uh, the Netherlands had more pri privileges because they were seen as racially closer to Germany or Germans. Uh, so they could get packages, they were paid better uh, and they had more access to stores and that sort of thing, rations. Um, and for all these reasons, you see relationships pop up and even continue afterwards. Um, over the months that Severilova shared with the Italians, she became close to one in particular named Brasildo Antolucci. Um, that's what I kind of gather his name is because his, doc his name in the Russian documents is rendered almost incomprehensible, but Brasildo Antolucci. Saying it, I'm trying to say it with a Russian accent, it's not really working. Um, her friend Antonina Shubovich uh, met another man, Giuseppe Bacciarelli, and uh, at the end of the war, Shubovich became pregnant from him, and um, she described this as a marriage. And for perhaps this reason, she accepted Bacciarelli's invitation to go to Italy with him after the war to Sicily. And Delucci similarly invited Severilova to go to Italy, to Naples. Um, this is what Severilova interpreted after the war as a marriage proposal. She described it as marriage. Um, whether that's true or not, it's unclear. Uh, nonetheless, she rejected this proposal and thought that she was going to go to the Soviet Union. After a few days or weeks, it's unclear from her post-return uh, testimony, she changed her mind and decided that she wanted to go to Antolucci. And of course, such invitations and such um, decisions to go to Italy, it countermanded what a lot of Soviet and allied leaders wanted as they met at Yalta. So at Yalta in February 1945, the big three, um, Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, and uh, FDR, met in Crimea to discuss what's going to happen to the post war world, in addition to deciding the division of Europe and the division of Germany. Um, they decided what would happen to displaced persons. Um, now, it's a complicated calculus on both sides. The Soviet Union, uh, Soviet leaders at least, saw these people as being between victims and traitors. They were victims because they had been taken from, from their homes to Germany, um, but they were traitors because they had worked in German factories and farms and had contributed to the German war economy. It was never clear 
what the relationship should be, both to officials and to ordinary Soviet people. What was never in doubt was that the Soviet um, leadership needed these people to come back. 27 million people had died during the war in the Soviet Union. And there were as many as 7 million Soviet people, you know, they didn't know the exact figures, but millions of Soviet people out there waiting to come home, ready to contribute to the Soviet economy, according to in the mindset of the Soviet leadership. Um, so that's one pragmatic reason they wanted these people to come back. Another reason is that the ability of a state to exercise control over its over the subjects it claims is um, a proxy for its authority in the world, for its ability to project power. And in the post-war world, if you couldn't get your displaced people back, that is not a good sign for you as a great power. Now, for their part, the Western allies had um, ambivalent feelings about forced repatriation of displaced persons. Um, there was a fear that people that Stalin claimed would be subject to um, the gulag, being a, you know, sent to prison to a forced labor camp, or even to execution. This fear was especially true of people who had served in pro-German formations. There were a number of Soviet uh, former POWs who had defected um, under very harsh conditions, um, not all of them very sympathetic to uh, Nazi ideology. In fact, many of them not sympathetic at all to, uh, to the Germans, but desperate to avoid starvation in the forced labor in um, the POW camps, went over to the Germans and served them for, for years in some cases. The Western allies feared that these people in particular would be subject to, um, to repression. The Western allies also did not want to recognize the um, territories the Soviet Union had annexed in the, the pact with Germany in 1940, uh, 1939. And so it was excluding Baltic people, so Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, and people from Western Ukraine and the Western uh, Belarusian territories from this um, from compulsory repatriation. But the Western allies also did not want to deal with a refugee crisis. They didn't want millions of Soviet people on their hands and to have to feed them and to organize them and to deal with crime, or at least the perception of crime. And they also wanted to please, please the Soviet Union, who is a, an ally still, and an ally going forward into the war with Japan. And uh, a third reason is that the Soviet Union had something like a million um, Western allied citizens under its control, POWs who were in, who had liberated in Europe, in Poland, for, for example, and uh, the Western allies wanted to have those people back. So it's a kind of hostage negotiation. For all these reasons, um, both sides agree to the unconditional repatriation of allied citizens, you know, with those caveats about Baltic peoples and uh, people from Western Ukraine. Despite this nominal agreement among the allies, things were much more fluid um, as they unfolded in Germany and uh, in formerly German occupied Europe. Uh, these, a lot of these people didn't have documents to show that they were Soviet or French or Italian or whatever. Um, and the authorities on the ground often relied on the people themselves to say, I am Soviet, I am Italian, and to let themselves be repatriated. Um, for that reason, I suspect that um, many people actually volunteered to go to the Soviet Union. Something like 2 million people came back from Western control to the Soviet Union. I don't think that so many people would have come back in a, a matter of months if many of them did not want to come back. And you can see here in this picture, there's a um, one of the chapters in my book examines the, um, the growth of pro-Soviet organizations under Western allied control. Um, and you can see here they've produced these Stalin posters and are distributing to them to um, displaced persons on their way home to the Soviet Union. Of course, Severilova and her friend were not among those who wanted to return. They wanted to go to Italy. Um, so um, Nadezhda Severilova followed her friend uh, Shubovich and her husband, Shubovich's husband, to a displaced persons camp in Braunschweig and then did to the south of Germany to Mittenwald where there was a displaced persons camp for people going to Italy. Um, at this point, it's a little bit unclear what happens. It seems that uh, 
Severilova claimed to be Bacciarelli, the, the husband's sister, and Allied officials said, wait a second, you don't look anything like him, and you don't speak Italian as well as he does, and you have a very different accent. And also, it seems like Shubovich did not want her friend to be an interloper in her recent marriage and did not defend her. So um, Severilova was rejected. She found an alternate plan. A translator in the camps helped her to claim to be a Polish person and got her a spot in a Polish school called Polonia. It's not this one, but <laughs> it's, it's a school like this. This is uh, one of the um, things that displaced persons camps in the Western zones of Germany and Austria did is they set up, they were kind of hot heads of nationalism. So you had Polish schools being set up, Ukrainian schools being set up, Baltic uh, nationals setting up their own schools, um, Jewish uh, DP setting up their schools and, and really um, becoming these nations in the context of, of Germany, post-war Germany. So Shubovich, or excuse me, Severilova goes to one of these schools called Polonia, where she's going to be trained to be a nurse. She doesn't like it apparently, or maybe she can't speak Polish. In any case, she it's unclear why she dropped out. She doesn't show up for many classes and she and a group of Soviet uh, people from Soviet territories end up getting kicked out of the, the school. At this point, she and the translator come up with a, a different plan. Um, she's going to pretend to be Italian, go to the Italian consul in Munich, she goes to him and convinces him that she is a war orphan. She actually is or, uh, an orphan. She actually is an orphan from Kiev, um, but she is an orphan from Italy, from Naples. Her grandfather took her around Europe and that's why her accent is bad. And that's why um, you know, she needs to find her way home. He gives her a pass for whatever reason, maybe she bribed him. I, it's, very, it's a very fuzzy part of the story. Um, in any case, she gets some kind of pass from him and goes to the Mittenwald camp. camp. At that point, the Allied authorities are supposed to check out her story, to you know, phone Naples or telegram Naples and say, is there a, you know, a Nelly Antolucci? That's the name she takes. She takes her Italian boyfriend's name, Antolucci. Is there a, a Nelly Antolucci that was an orphan or was orphaned by her parents? She doesn't wanna wait for the, for the response. So she gets on a train, is hidden by some friendly Italians and makes it to Naples where she becomes um, a maid for local authorities, where you know she asks for her um, to find her boyfriend, they can't find her, and she finds a job for a year as a maid. Now, um, I want to take a quick step back here. Um, let me switch over to map just so you have a sense of of her geography. A step back to to discuss what's extraordinary about this story and what's ordinary. You know, what's ordinary about this story is that um, Severilova's nationality, her national identity, was in flux. Um, it was fairly easy for her to present herself as a Polish person. Polish DP camps, a lot of them were willing, even eager to take people from um, who could be repatriated to the Soviet Union and to you know, assimilate them in a sense, um, to give them background stories even. Western allied, individual Western allied officials were willing to do so too, as, as we see with the translator. And in fact, there were a million people in, uh, in Germany and Austria who did not want to go back to their countries, whether that were, or their countries of um, pre-war countries, whether that was Poland or the Soviet Union or you know, the Baltic Republics. And it was, if not easy, then it was possible for someone like Severilova to blend in with those people. It was not as common to become Italian, but her circumstances highlight the legacy of forced labor in, in Nazi Germany, that there were real relationships that came out of this. It was, a, it was a form of barracks transnationalism is what I call it in the book, where people did make um, ties become multinational in a sense. Um, and she clearly learned Italian to some degree enough to convince this uh, Italian consul. Now, finally, Severilla's decision to avoid repatriation was somewhat unusual, unusual in the sense that um, most people who went to Germany from, the, from Soviet territories went back. Um, my sense is that they went back because of family, because of language, because they expected the Soviet Union, Soviet state to treat them better than they had been treated in Nazi Germany and they were not sure what would happen under another capitalist regime. Why Severilova didn't go back um, has a lot to do 
with her background. She was an orphan. She had been raised in an orphanage. Um, her mother was alive, but has some psychological problems or maybe alcohol problems. Her other family members were alcoholics. She, she noted in her testimony. She didn't really have a home to go to. And so the prospect of um, finding a husband in Italy was much more attractive to her than to a lot of these former forced laborers who had families waiting for them, had you know, a job at the collective farm at least, and could go home. Now, after a year of working and unsuccessfully looking for Antolucci, Severilova decided to um, go back, go back to the Soviet Union. This was also an unusual choice uh, for her. About 5% of people who didn't go back initially decided to go back in, in the end. And a lot of them went back, uh, not by, you know, willingly, but actually under, under guard because they had been, they had served in German units and American and British forces were willing to send those kind of people back because they saw them as wartime enemies who, who maybe deserve punishment. Now, what it seems happened with Severilova is that she was unhappy with her job and she wanted to go back to the Soviet Union and have some kind of social mobility. That's my reading of the situation. She ended up at the camp at St. Valentin, St. Valentin in Austria, where because of her unusual biography, she was kept for a year and interrogated um, pretty regularly as she worked at the camp as a librarian. She reunited briefly with Shubovich, her friend, whose marriage seems to have fallen apart. She had a child now and she came back with the child. She was less, um, Shubovich was less suspicious than, than Severilova and she passed through fairly quickly. Uh, finally, Severilova was, was released from the camp, made her way home uh, by the end of 1947, right at the very end. She enrolled at 20 years old in a school to finish her elementary school education, which she had um, not been able to do because she had been deported at night. She, she finished this education. And then it seems she enrolled in a night school for nursing while she worked. She finished her night school, her nursing school, and it seems everything seems to be going well with her. She got a new job as a nurse and that's where she ran into trouble. Um, we don't know what precipitated her arrest, but it seems like uh, it was that Soviet authorities were told when she, um, when she got this new job that she had been to Germany. Like I said earlier, um, these returnees were seen both as victims and traitors. You see this picture here that portrays Eastern workers that have the Ost symbol on them as being liberated by the Red Army. That's the public image. But in day-to-day -day life, they faced a lot of difficulties getting jobs, getting into um, organizations like the Communist Party or even the, the Young Communist League. Um, and at every step of the way, when they had to fill out an application for whatever, for school or for these organizations, they had to put, they, they had been in Germany. That became a layer of their identity that was ambivalent at best. It was not that they were victims, but actually that, may, that they had been in cahoots with the Germans. Severilova was especially suspicious. I was especially um, someone that could not be trusted because she had been away for a year because she had lived under the Western allies. And here an important part of the story is the Cold War. That from 1946, the alliance uh, between the Western allies and the Soviet Union falls apart. Um, the willingness to work together on displaced persons among other things falls away. And the and Soviet authorities and the secret police increasingly see uh, returnees as potential spies, people who were recruited by the Western allies in DP camps to um, infiltrate and sabotage the Soviet Union. A lot of these spy, you know, supposed spy attempts are actually um, things like, they say that the rations were, were good under the Americans, that the ration kits in DP camps were good, they were so much better than under the Germans, it's probably true, and yet it's pro-American propaganda from a spy. That's the kind of thing that could land them in jail, as little as that. And of course, Severilla has, uh, has a much more um, problematic biography. She had gone to this Polish school where she had been trained in maybe nursing, but maybe to be a spy, uh, according to Soviet authorities. And she was among the um, 
several hundred people who were arrested. Now they investigated much, many more people. This is in Ukraine alone, about 5,000 people just to 1948 um, and hundreds of them. So something like 3% were, were arrested. The main thing, the main evidence they found against Severilova was her own, that they asked her, you know, what did you do during the war? And she confirmed the basic elements of her story that she had gone to Mittenwald to follow Antolucci, that she'd gone to this Polish school. And Shubovich, who is now in Kiev as well, confirmed these basic aspects. Um, she testified against her friend or testified in the case of her friend, um, who's not her, her friend in the end. Um, the secret police saw these incidents through the lens of Stalinist paranoia, that these were not the moves of someone who is desperate to get to a boyfriend, someone who is a romantic 17 or 18 year old who wanted um, to seek, search out love and maybe a better life in Italy, but someone who was working for British or American intelligence. Based on the strength of her own testimony against herself and some paid informants, it seems like they were paid from her own, her, from her cell, she was sentenced to 25 years in the Gulag. Now, she only served four of those years until the post-Stalin uh, government under Khrushchev released her as part of a mass amnesty. At that point, she was 28 years old. She had lived about a quarter of her life in some kind of um, camp, whether in Nazi Germany or in the Soviet Union. So the ordeal that she faced, and here we can see, you know, I think this is a nice picture because it shows people who want to go back, but you can almost see the ambivalence on their faces as they're looking at these Soviet authorities. Um, you know, a photo doesn't necessarily say everything, but that's, that's how I, I read it or how I'd like to read it. Um, the ordeal that she faced was part of the Cold War, the Severilo faced, but it was also part of the broader attempt of Stalin's regime to deal with the tumult of World War II. So it was, it's both. The regime trying to put a lid on all this chaos that had happened during the war, all the identities that got mixed up. They wanted her to be um, a returnee, a grateful and silent person, someone from a poster like this, who's happy just to be alive, just to have been saved. And in some ways, her story raises uncomfortable questions about the limits of Soviet control over its own subjects, about the ability of the Soviet Union to protect its uh, own people, and about the um, ability of the Soviet Union to um, control interactions with potential enemies like the Anglo-American uh, former allies. For the most part, people saw cases like Severilova's or you know, saw people being brought into the secret police offices to be interrogated. A lot of them left, but they were scared. And they learned that they should keep silent about their stories, that they shouldn't talk about their experiences in Germany. They shouldn't talk about their Italian boyfriends during the war. They shouldn't talk about whether the rations in the DP camps were good or people were nice or Germans especially were nice. Um, you know, one of the issues that made writing this book difficult um, was the silences you find in it because people didn't want to talk about it. They only wanted to talk about it well after the fact. You only found um, testimony that was given freely in the 2000s in, in a large database of oral histories. And one thing that makes Severilova's story so valuable uh, is that it's from the time she's recording it fresh after she she experienced it. There are many problems with the testimony given to a secret police under, officer under interrogation. And yet um, the extraordinary story that she reveals, um, you know, that's also a problem that perhaps she is not as representative as the millions of other people who came back to the Soviet Union and lived a life um, of silence about their past. Yet the tumult and opportunity that came with her wartime displacement um, and the post-war attempt to create stability really comes through in her account uh, in a way that is inaccessible otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. And now it's my pleasure to moderate any questions and answers anyone would like to pose. I don't see any yet in the Q&A or in the, if I'll give you a, a minute to do that. Um, this is not my first introduction to Seth. Dr. Bernstein's work, I had a pleasure of reading a chapter of it, including some of the material. It's really wonderful. It's a, I do think it works as a story that tells the whole book. I think it's yeah, really- Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. 
as you know, we've talked about this before that I, I thought about structuring this book a little bit differently. So it's 10 chapters that each tell a big social history in a sense that um, one of them deals with the experience of Eastern workers in Germany and the labor conditions they face. Another deals with mm, the experience of, of Severilova and others like her who are facing these spy accusations. Um, others deal with um, how the Soviet Union portrayed these people after the war and, and what happened to people who tried to fight for a more heroic narrative of their lives. Um, and I thought about making the chapters exactly like this, that each of them would would be a story of someone like Sivarilova. And I, and I thought that I would lose too much of that big social history, unfortunately, but maybe I was wrong. But now, but now that you've written that, you could do this. You could actually write special stories about just individuals and have a little fun. Not, not maybe all of them, but right. you know what I mean? Just to see what, what, what it means to do this methodologically, what it gives you to, right. to use one story. Because right. I... I mean, you lose, I like, I mean, a lot of what I love about what you're doing, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking of Tara Zara's book and I'm thinking of all the different arguments about national identity and what's going on in this interwar, you know, this 45 to 48 period. It's, it's very rich to have this part of the story because we haven't really had that before. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand yeah. the temptation to want to do the big because you can engage with all of those questions that other historians of Europe are asking, but and, oh, wait, wait, I see a question, I see questions. Um, so one question is, do you know anything about her life after the time in the Gulag? And I'm gonna let you, and then there's a second one, and that's from an anonymous attendee, so I don't have a name, but um, Lisa Booth is asking, this is such a fascinating story, and I think shows much more agency than is typically afforded to Eastern European women. Um, <laughs> it's not really a question, but um, maybe you could say more about that, if, and, and the question about the Gulag. Sure. So about the Gulag, she, um, as I said, spent about four years in the Gulag, was released. Um, and we don't know that much about what happened afterwards. So these, the file that I have on her is about 400 pages long. Most of it is made up of her interrogations with secret police. Um, the last probably 30 pages are about um, her efforts to, to appeal the, the judgment. In the late 1980s, there was an effort on the part of Gorbachev's um, government to um, rehabilitate even more people. So under Khrushchev, there was a, a small rehabilitation, a large amnesty, but a small rehabilitation. And in fact, Khrushchev treated, his regime treated her as a spy. You know, they just said she was a minor spy. She, her going to that Polish camp was not an offense that deserved 25 years in the Gulag, but you know, three years is fine. She can get off. Even Gorbachev's regime said something similar. The, the people who um, reviewed the case under, under Gorbachev. Now, what happened to her at that point, and that's unclear where, where she worked or what she did, but at that point, you know, she carried that with her her whole life because um, she appealed either in 89 or in the early 90s, I'm, I'm not sure. She appealed and she talked about how they had abused her, how they had taken her documents and ripped them up the secret police, they really treated her badly. And I can't remember if she talked about being beaten in the interrogations, but um, certainly there was psychological abuse. She remembered it. She remembered it for a long time, for 40 years, um, or you know, almost 40 years. And she had the interrogator, she remembered the names of the interrogators too. She had them uh, called to authorities at the time in the, in the late 80s, or early 90s, and they had to answer for themselves. And the interrogators didn't give an inch. They said that everything they had done was right. She was a traitor to the motherland. They were they had not changed, and uh, you know one ounce, which is kind of amazing. Um, but we don't know exactly what happened. She was rehabilitated in the end, um, which, if there's a, a happy part of the story, she would have been in her sixties at that time and she would have been eligible for a better pension and some kind of um, compensation. Can I ask, I'm gonna, I wanna follow up on that, but there's also another question that um, Alice Freifeld asked you mm -hmm. um, after thanking you for the talk, how does um, she navigate in the DB camps, such as polls relating to her as a pole 
or US, work, US workers sorting people. Do you see any evidence of that in her file? So there, there's not um, any real evidence of her, how she managed to portray herself in certain ways, except the Italian sense, um, you know, because we get a, we do know um, about how she managed to do that. Yeah, so the, the, what it tells us about her interactions as a, as a Pole um, is more about what, how the Soviet Union saw that than about how she viewed it because Soviet authorities were very skeptical that someone who could become, could become, um, could be in between. And I am much less skeptical about that, that someone could you know, portray themselves as, as Polish she may have, you know, she doesn't say in, in her testimony, but she may have known Polish people as a forced laborer. It seems clear, though, that she was not happy about being at that Polish camp, whether that's because she didn't like the actual Polish content of it, or because she wanted to go to Italy so badly that she, um, that that was really her, her goal. Um, but certainly there's a lot of evidence about people who were able to switch their identities, not in a um, contrived way, not in the way that we would think of as fake, but in a real way that, you know, they were something in between uh, Ukrainian and Polish or in between Western Ukrainian and someone who had been raised in the Soviet Union. So I'm gonna follow up on a quick question. I just wanted to follow up that goes with this identity question at the Gulag. Was there sort of repatriation training? I mean, was there re-education? Was that, so were they ad addressing this issue? And then there is another question, which I wanna, that just came up on the board. Um, thank you, this was extremely interesting. Is there any record of how people outside of the government treated her, her peers, her neighbors, um, the tense interactions between citizens and Soviets deemed enemies of the people her spun, spurred some of my own curiosity for research. That's from Hannah Bedard. Yeah, so um, let, let me address your question first, Cheryl. Um, so there was some training of, not training, but a um, re-immersion of Soviet people back into the Soviet Union. There is a process called filtration that every Soviet person had to do. It's a essentially an interview with um, a secret police officer that all Soviet people who came from Germany who were displaced had to explain what they had done if they had known any traitors, um, where they had worked before the war. It, it's in a lot of cases pro forma, especially at the height of repatriation. It's still an unpleasant experience. Um, and it trains them in the ways to present themselves. So it, it teaches them what kind of story they're supposed to offer. You, the, it's no, it's no um, coincidence that so many of them talk about um, being mistreated by Germans, um, and that might be totally real. I mean, not might be, but it is also real, but it's something that they emphasize right. as a way to treat themselves as victims. Mm, I suspect that the secret police interrogators mm, helped them with that, helped them with yeah. that interpretation and, and gave them a sense of the correct narrative that they should offer. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so Hannah, uh, how did other people outside the government treat her? peers, neighbors? I don't remember in her case that she has any um, any negative interactions with other people. The people she mentions in her in her file are mostly her relatives who she has other problems with that you know they're, they're not willing to take her back. Unclear if it's because she's a repatriate that she came from outside the Soviet Union or because she just has these problems with a, you know, problem family members because they have substance abuse problems. Um, now we know in a lot of cases that from these oral history interviews that when people came back, they were treated really poorly, that they were treated as traitors. It, in part, it's a, a distancing. It's not necessarily because people actually saw them as traitors, but because they thought that the Soviet state might treat them as traitors. There was no official pronouncement, good or bad. Um, and people erred on the side of bad. I mean, there was enough bad, there was enough arrests going around. About 6% of people of um, repatriates were arrested upon filtration. That's a lot, that's a lot. It's enough to make you nervous. And, uh, and something like one and a half percent were arrested in the subsequent years. It's a lot. 
Um, so I have another question for you that that Natalia put in Nat Natalia Alexian put in um, the chat by accident. So I'm going to read it to you. Thank you for a great talk. In the files, does she show any political agency? Does she speak about what being Soviet mean, meant to her? Was she Russian or was she Ukrainian? From the documents itself. Hi, Natalia. Right. So, so officially, she is a Ukrainian. Her testimony is recorded in Russian. Uh, and the entire file is in Russian. But that doesn't necessarily mean she was speaking Russian. There are other cases where um, I know that the person was a Ukrainian speaker by preference, but they were um, their testimony was recorded in Russian. Uh, in her case, she does express her patriotism, that she is devoted to the motherland, that she did not intend to be anti-Soviet. And this comes out most clearly in her later writings, in her amnesty appeals and in her um, re rehabilitation appeals that she was young, she made a mistake, she was following love, which I think sounds about right to me when you're 17 or 18, you make dumb decisions. Whether we can actually say that she is pro-Soviet, it's unclear. She does, um, she did join the Young Communist League when she came back to the Soviet Union and was in it for a period of, uh, it's unclear how long she was in it, but um, of course she was stripped of that when she was arrested. That may be a sign that she actually is um, re-Sovietizing herself. Certainly, it's a sign that she is um, giving herself over to Soviet uh, norms and Soviet rules and being a member of Soviet po <clears throat> political society. Whether that's pragmatic or um, genuinely felt is, is unclear because the, the sources are so compromised in a way. Well, thank you. I think we're out of time. Aren't I supposed to finish by 1240? By yeah, we're officially out of time. But there's been <laughs> a conversation, so I wanted to, to let it go. But um, Seth, thank you so much for, for giving us this really interesting talk. And Cheryl, thank you for moderating. There were, as I expected, a fair number of really excellent questions. And thank you to the, um, the audience, especially those who've stuck with us uh, for the full for the full duration. So again, thank you and uh, have a lovely thank afternoon. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Amy. Bye. Thanks,